Amen. The psalmist said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. That's not the sermon. That's for free. That's extra. You know, I first tasted of the Lord 44 years ago, and it's still good today. He's been faithful to me when I have been unfaithful to him. He's been good to me when I have not been good to him. And that's what makes him such a great God and Heavenly Father. If you would open your Bibles today to Revelation chapter 3. If you're using the Bible in the seat in front of you, that's page 190 in the black Bible, page 594 in the blue. The last of the seven churches, the church located at Laodicea. Now, with your Bible, now look, your search doesn't end when you arrive at a body of knowledge that you're comfortable with or that you think fits the facts of reality. Your search for truth ends when you meet Jesus. For He is the embodiment of all truth. You see, God became flesh and walked the earth as a human. And this human Jesus was the loudest and clearest proclamation of truth humanity has ever experienced. Every sermon that He preached, every conversation that He had, every miracle that He performed faithfully pointed men to the truth that is God. Now, don't kid yourself. You may be here this morning, and you may be highly educated. But if you haven't arrived at the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God, sent down from heaven to redeem you from your sins, you got more work to do. Your search is far from over, because He is the final word when it comes to truth. He is the faithful and true witness. He's also the origin of the creation of God. He says this. Now listen carefully so that I'm not accused of heresy and you tar and feather me on the parking lot when church is over. After all, it is pastor appreciation. I mean, at least wait till next month to do that, right? No, we don't do that here. Hopefully they don't do that anywhere anymore. This does not mean that Jesus was a created being. One of the ways that Satan effectively slowed down the momentum of the early church was to bog it down with doctrinal controversy. Early on, he targeted the central tenet of the Christian faith, which was the nature of Jesus Christ. Around the 3rd and 4th centuries, the church contended with a heresy known as Arianism. Arianism taught that Jesus was not eternal, but rather had been created by God. And the controversy became so severe that the Emperor Constantine actually intervened. He convened a church council known as the Council of Nicaea in AD 325. And from that council came the Nicene Creed. If you know your church history, maybe you've read it, maybe some of you have memorized it. The Nicene Creed is an affirmation of the biblical truth that Jesus was not created, but rather was the Creator, co-eternal with the Father. And so this phrase in Revelation, the origin of the creation of God, means that Jesus was the Creator. Everything that was made originated with Him. John said this in the Gospel he wrote. John's Gospel, chapter 1. Look up at the screen. He said, In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He wasn't created at some later point. Oh, no, he was there at the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So he is the creator God. Now, what does somebody with such incredible credentials, with such an impressive resume, what does he have to say to this local church here at Laodicea? Well, not anything good. In fact, he goes right into the condemnation. Look at verse 15. He says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So as he assessed this church's spiritual condition, he said they weren't hot or cold. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, near Laodicea, there were two cities. The city of Colossa was built against an 8,000-foot high mountain, and they had a fresh supply of cold water streaming down the mountain that was suitable for drinking. The city of Heropolis was nearby. On the other hand, it was known for its mineral hot springs, which had great therapeutic value. 
Well, the city of Laodicea was built and it did not have its own natural water supply. So they had to build an aqueduct to bring water into the city. The problem is the genius who designed it decided to bring the water from the mineral hot springs instead of the cold mountain spring coming from Colossa. And so by the time the water flowed from Heropolis through the pipes into the city, it was neither cold nor hot, but rather it was tepid. And on top of that, it was filled with minerals. It was undrinkable, really good for nothing. And so as Jesus assessed the spiritual condition of the church, here's what he said. You're good for nothing. Look at verse 16. It gets worse. He says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Have you ever had to have a tough conversation with somebody that you didn't get along with? I mean, in the course of the conversation, you probably found a better way to say it than that, didn't you? I mean, maybe you walk up and you say, look, you and I have some personality clashes. It's probably not good that we, you know, invade each other's space too frequently but brother hugo to walk up to somebody and say you make me nauseous how do you think that conversation is going to turn out literally that when i get around you i feel like throwing up that's what jesus said to this church so what was going on that would make the son of god talk like this well it was their attitude write this down they had an attitude of apathy and here's what caused it verse 17 because you say i am rich and have become wealthy and have no need of anything you see they had so much money that they reached a point where they no longer needed god now listen to me very carefully here there is nothing wrong with being wealthy read the old testament abraham was very wealthy job very wealthy read the life of solomon solomon was probably the world's first and only trillionaire he had so much gold that literally there was no market on silver that's how wealthy he was god has no problem with your owning wealth he does have a problem however when your wealth owns you and the laodiceans had no idea just how serious a problem this had become so jesus has to spell it out for him he has to lay it out verse 17 and you do not know that you are wretched in greek this word wretched means that you are afflicted sick hurting they were hurting they didn't know it some of you are familiar with the term neuropathy neuropathy occurs when the nerves are damaged to the point where they lose sensation it usually happens in the extremities If left untreated, damage can occur to the tissue and the person doesn't even experience pain because the nerve endings are blunted and they can no longer feel pain. And this church had a case of spiritual neuropathy. Next he says, they are miserable. That's the Greek word eleanos. It means that they are not in a position to help themselves like a beggar on the street. Their spiritual neuropathy had progressed to a point where they couldn't help themselves. Look at the next word. They were also poor. This is the Greek word tokos. We've seen this word before. It was used to describe the economic condition of the church at Smyrna. This is abject poverty, where you lack the very basic essentials necessary for survival. This word did not describe the economic condition of the believers at Laodicea, but Jesus uses it to describe their spiritual condition. He says, you don't have the basic essentials. You are abject in your poverty. And then he says this, you're blind. Their materialistic worldview had blinded them so that they only saw things in the here and now. Their perspective was limited only to this earth. They had no spiritual vision. If you sat in their leadership meetings, no doubt all they talked about was earthly things, not things that pertain to heaven. That's why Jesus said they were blind. 
And then he really drops one of them. Look at this next word. And naked. You don't wear any clothes. Now, several years ago, I was at home watching the Huskers play Texas. And it was a home game, and we had a lot of obnoxious Texas fans up here who were overjoyed when we lost. Well, I watched the game at home, and my wife had been out and about running errands. Well, when she came through the front door, I knew that she was upset because she slammed the door shut. And I mean, she slammed it shut with such ferocity that it shook the front wall of the house. My first thought was, wow, she sure is taking this loss hard. Well, she's taking this worse than I am. So I thought I would run upstairs and try to console her, but it was to no avail. So I said, sweetie, what's the matter? And she said, well, as I was coming back from the store, somebody with Texas plates had done the unthinkable. And that is, seeing that she had Nebraska plates, he mooned her going down the road. Now, I started laughing because that kind of thing happens all the time where I grew up in Atlanta. I mean, every day it was an occurrence on the beltway that went around Atlanta. One redneck would cut off the other redneck in traffic, and then a sequence would unfold before your very eyes. There obviously would be the rolling down of the window and the exchanging of unrepeatable words, then the hand gestures, and then I knew what was coming next someone's hinder parts were going to be hanging out the car window going down the road so when it happened to her i mean it wasn't something she was used to i saw it all the time now it's repulsive not to wear clothes because what we wear says a lot about who we are the clothes we wear are often a status symbol of our affluence and this was true in laodicea as well the local shepherds around laodicea were known for raising a rare breed of sheep that grew black wool and a line of luxury clothing was produced from this rare black wool. So when Jesus calls them naked, here's what he's saying. You may wear the finest clothes that men can produce, but you lack the true righteousness that comes from being clothed with my robe of perfection. Those expensive black woolen garments cannot hide the shame and guilt of your sin. Now all of these negative adjectives, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked all point to one problem and here it is self-sufficiency at the root of self-sufficiency is the original sin of the human race which is pride and the deceitfulness of materialism lulls us into thinking that we have everything that we need in life and we no longer need god and i'm afraid that many of us find ourselves in that very same condition this morning did you know that we live in the most affluent and wealthy culture that human, human civilization has ever produced. Nobody has ever had it as good as we do. We are wealthier, more prosperous than any other people at any other time in human history. We are certainly blessed in a unique way to live in the United States of America. But wealth can be put to good use. It can also lure us into the trap of thinking that we don't have to depend upon God. And that is a very dangerous place to be in. So how can this condition be reversed? What's the cure? Well, Jesus tells them some words of correction. Look at verse 18. He says, I advise you. Notice the soft tone that he takes with them. He is reasoning with them here, friend to friend. He doesn't take a harsh tone with them like he did in Pergamum and Thyatira. Those churches were experiencing doctrinal and moral issues. This was an attitude problem, which is why Jesus calmly comes to him and says, let me advise you. Let me give you some counsel. And he's going to do it in terminology that they can understand. He says, I advise you to buy from me. The church at Laodicea understood purchasing power. So Jesus said, let's go on a little shopping trip together. Not to the malls, not to the famous marketplaces of Laodicea. Oh, no. Let's go shopping at the storehouse of my grace. And while you're there, I want you to pick up three things that will help you deal with your materialistic philosophy. And here's the first item. <coughs> he says, I advise you to buy from me, write this down, gold. The most valuable of all the precious metals 
Currently, an ounce of gold is worth $1,770. Fathom that. Just an ounce. Investors tell you that in times of economic uncertainty, such as when your government prints trillions of dollars they don't have, that gold is, is the safest haven for your investment. But that's not the kind of gold that Jesus speaks of here. He wants them to get a special kind of gold. He says, buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. Refined gold is gold that has been heated to the point of melting. A high temperature of 1,948 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. At this temperature, gold becomes liquid. And all of the impurities then come to the top where the refiner can skim them off. And then when it's removed from the fire, it cools and hardens. But what you have is more pure. And in this sense, this gold represents our faith when it has been tried and purified. Look at what Peter said. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. And this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been, notice this next word, distressed, heated up, melted, skimmed off the top. You've been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which perishes though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, this is the kind of faith they had in Smyrna, the church that had been purified by persecution. Jesus said, you know your brothers and sisters over there in Smyrna that are going through the fire? You need some of what they got. Now, how do you get that gold? Well, you have to go on offense. You can't be a passive Christian. You can't be a secret disciple. You have to let your faith be known. If I may say, you have to live dangerously for Jesus Christ. You have to take some risk. See, this church was comfortable. You know, they weren't taking any risks. No one viewed them as a threat. The devil doesn't kick a dead horse. And by the way, as we present the gospel to the world, as we carry God's absolute truth to the ends of creation, we better get ready for some persecution. We better get ready for some resistance because I want the devil to view us as a threat. You know, I want to live my life in such a way that I am public enemy number one in the halls of hell. Now, I'm not saying that boasting because there comes a huge, huge price with that, and that is the devil knows exactly how to attack you. But are you living as a threat to the kingdom of darkness? That's what Jesus says. I want you to heat things up a little bit. I want you to stop playing it safe. Take some chances. This addressed their spiritual poverty. Now he addresses their spiritual nakedness. Here's the second item they were to pick up. Verse 18. And white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we mentioned that white garments are mentioned seven different times in Revelation. Each time it refers to the sinner being clothed in the perfection of Christ's righteousness. And what we have here is a call for the church to examine itself and to make sure that they have actually been born again. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's because the more wealth we accumulate, the easier it is to place our trust in riches instead of the Redeemer. That's why Jesus said, make sure you are clothed with my righteousness. And then he addresses their blindness. Here's the third item, verse 18. And I salve to apply to your eyes so that you may see. The eye clinic in Laodicea had developed what became known in the Roman Empire as Phrygian powder made from minerals in the nearby hot springs. The tablets could be ground down, mixed with water, and made into a salve that when applied would remedy many ailments of the eye. And the only way to correct the blindness caused by their materialistic worldview was to pay Jesus a visit and have him touch their eyes so they could see things the way that he saw them. You see, the problem was this church was not having fellowship with Christ. 
And when they weren't having fellowship with Christ, they were cut off from the ability to see the world as he saw it. And it caused the spiritual blindness. Look at verse 19. Those whom I love. He tells this church, I love you. Now, earlier he said, you know, you make me so sick, I want to throw up. Now he says, but wait a minute. I do love you. And I'm going to show my love to you by doing two things. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Let me ask you a question this morning. Sometime in the course of your spiritual journey, have you ever doubted as to whether or not you were truly saved? Have you ever struggled with the assurance of your salvation? Well, I think that's happened to all of us, especially when we slip up and do something wrong. Well, let me give you some comfort this morning. The strongest bit of evidence that you have been saved is when you experience the chastening hand of God when you do wrong. And it happens in two ways. Jesus says, first of all, those whom I love, I rebuke. He rebukes us. That's the Greek word elekko, which means to expose, convict, or punish. And that rebuke usually comes to us in the form of guilt. Now let's go back to the story of my beloved wife and her unfortunate episode with the distraught Texas fan. Now suppose my wife on that day was having a horrible day before she encountered this Texas fan. And so after he does what he did, she pulls up beside him at a red light, decides she's had enough. And so she gets out of the car, goes around, un, 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 uh, opens his car door, slaps him around a few times, and then drags him out there on the street and just beats the tarnations out of him, and then drives off. Now, you know my wife, you know that if there's 8 billion people on the earth, she would be the very last person on earth that would ever do such a thing, which is why I say that. I, on the other hand, have thought about this a few times, haven't you? <laughs> and I hate to say it, but football games usually brings me to that point closer than anything else. So if you want to this morning to make you feel better, substitute the Texas fan for a Michigan fan. <laughs> well, does that ring home a little bit? Now, let's say Mrs. Davenport gets back in the car. She's driving home. Pretty soon, she's going to hear a still, small voice in her head that said, Terry, I'm ashamed of you. You're my child. I love you. That's not how a child of God acts. And so she's going to feel some guilt. That's the Spirit of God speaking to her. And pretty soon, that guilt is going to overcome her, and the guilt is going to drive her to repentance and the wonderful thing about guilt is that it drives you to God's grace. You know why? Because God loves you too much to let you do what you want to do. God loves you too much to let you live in sin. And if you can sin as a child of God, if you believe you're a child of God, if you can sin comfortably and practice sin without feeling any guilt, then maybe it's time you check yourself to make sure you've truly been born again. Because Jesus said, those whom I love, I rebuke. Then there's a second thing. He not only rebukes, he disciplines. This is the Greek word paiduo, and it means to assist in the development of the ability to make the right choice in the future. To keep us from failing again. The Spirit of God shows us how we can strengthen the weakness in our life that caused us to fail. Because spiritually speaking, you are only strong as your weakest link. Let me illustrate. Some of you know that for many years I, I've been blessed to, to compete in the sport of powerlifting. And when I moved to Nebraska, I had a great blessing of being surrounded with, with men who had been in the sport for many years who knew way more than I did. Because when I moved to this state, I was pretty stupid. I was doing things that really was going to lead me to get hurt and hurt bad and not enjoy the, the career that I've had. Well, early on in Nebraska, I'll never forget 2002, Pastor Carl went with me to a meet at Dana College up in Blair, and it was one of those meets where everything went right. And so at the end of the day, I was the last lifter, and I said, I'm going to try to deadlift 705 pounds. I had done 666, and it came up so easy. I said, okay, I'll try 705. So I went out there, I remember, ran up to the bar. I grabbed the bar, I was psyched up, and I got it going and almost locked it out. And right as soon as I went to lock out my knees, 
the bar flew out of my hand. You know what the problem was? The problem wasn't my legs. The problem wasn't my back. The problem was my grip. It was my weakest link. So I went back to the gym six months later, tried the same weight. Same thing happened. Flew out of my hands. Next spring, same thing happened. I dropped it. So finally, I found an exercise that eventually allowed me in the spring of 04 to grab that bar. You know, and I have never dropped the bar since, and that's been 17 years. You know why? Because I put into practice a discipline that addressed my weakness. Now, Jesus says, when you do wrong, I'm going to rebuke you. And because I love you, I'm going to come along beside you, and I'm going to show you which habits to put into your life, which disciplines you can follow, so that you don't keep making the same mistake over and over and over. Look at verse 20. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He says, because I love you so much that I'm going to rebuke you and discipline you, I want you to get excited about repenting of your sins and becoming all that you can be for me. Behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. Now, this is one of the most misunderstood verses in all the Bible. And there's plenty of them. We hear verses quoted all the time that are out of context that really have absolutely no truth with the way that we're quoting them. One of those verses is Philippians 4.13. You ever heard it? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So many people take that verse and they put it on their mirror, they memorize it thinking, God will strengthen me to do anything that I want to do. That's not what that verse is saying. What if what you want to do is sin? I mean, you think the power of Christ is going to be available to you to go sin? Oh, no. Another verse, and I love this one, Jeremiah 29, 11. You know what it says? I know the plans that I have for you, plans that will prosper you. And people quote that verse saying, oh, God has a plan for my life that is good. Do you know what actually that passage is saying? He's talking to Israel. And he said, Israel, here is the wonderful plan I have for you. Nebuchadnezzar is going to pay you a visit and he's going to burn your city to the ground because you've been disobedient and he's going to haul you away 900 miles to Babylon that's the plan I have for you I don't know about you I don't want a plan like that God but we quote verses all the time out of context Revelation 3.20 is one of those verses he says behold I stand at the door and knock it's often presented as Jesus standing outside the door of a sinner's heart knocking on the door pleading to come in that's not what this verse is saying jesus isn't talking to lost people here he's talking to the church he's standing outside the door of the church knocking begging to come in you say why is jesus locked out of the church why have they shut the door on him they crowded him out they've been so blinded by their wealth that Jesus had been pushed right out the door. So he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. You see, when you eat together, you fellowship together. You draw closer together. This church had drawn closer to their riches. And the closer they drew to their riches, the further they went away from jesus christ to the point that when they actually came to church they forgot what they were coming to church for so jesus says let me back in let's restore that fellowship now notice last of all the challenge of verse 21 the one who overcomes he has concluded all seven letters in the exact same way the one who overcomes that's the greek verb nikto referring to the save the one who overcomes the devil by the blood of the lamb i will grant to him to sit with me on my throne as i also overcame and sat with my father on his throne write this down here's what he promises he promises us a seat on the throne sitting with jesus on the throne implies two things it's a place of honor and it's a place of rest one day jesus is returning to settle the score first time he came he was a baby in a manger second time he comes he comes as a thief in the night and he steals away his bride the church 
That's the rapture. We'll talk about it next week when we come to Revelation chapter 4. Seven years later, he returns with the clouds of heaven, and this time every eye will see him. And at the battle of Armageddon, he smashes all evil beneath his feet. And it is then and only then that the redeemed will both rule in a place of honor and rest. Verse 22. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What did the Spirit of God have to say to this church? He pointed out the folly of their materialistic worldview. He rebuked them for their attitude of self-sufficiency. And he reminded them that they need him. Alexander Solzhenitsyn spent 20 years in Stalin's gulag in the Soviet Union experiencing firsthand the horrors of communism. His time in the gulag is chronicled in his epic work, Gulag Archipelago, which in my opinion ought to be required reading among our juniors and seniors in high school so that the next generation can learn firsthand about the true nature of Marxism. Because this vile philosophy is being pushed upon our kids day after day after day in our schools. It'd be nice if they could hear the words of someone who suffered at the blunted edge of communism. But in 1983, he delivered a speech entitled, Men Have Forgotten God. During this speech, he talks about the great atrocities of the 20th century. He talks about the concentration camps. He talks about the gulags. He talks about the killing fields. All the great crimes against humanity that were perpetrated by regimes in the 20th century. You know what he blamed? He blamed the fact that men forgot about God. Here's what he said. Our life consists not in the pursuit of material success but in the quest for worthy spiritual growth. Our entire earthly existence is but a transitional stage in the movement towards something higher. And we must not stumble and fall, nor must we linger fruitlessly on one rung of the ladder. Material laws alone do not explain our life or give it direction. The laws of physics and physiology will never reveal the indisputable manner in which the Creator constantly day in and day out participates in the life of each of us unfailingly granting us the energy of existence when this assistance leaves us to die and in the life of our entire planet the divine spirit surely moves with no less force this we must grasp in our dark and terrible hour and may we never forget God may we never become so prosperous that it divides us and separates us from the infinite riches of his love and mercy and may he always rule supreme in our hearts and lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have been faithful to us. God, I thank you today that you have met our basic needs. Lord, that most of us in here have a roof over our head. Lord, we have food to eat when we go home. We have a little bit of money in the bank. Lord, we have some measure of security that the rest of the world does not have. But God, help us to never rely upon these material things. But rather, Lord, help us to trust in you. And Lord, I pray for the one in this building today that doesn't know you as their Savior. God, I pray they would stop trusting, Lord, in the sufficiency of their own good works or of their religious heritage. Lord, of the philosophy that they may cling to, but rather, God, may they depend solely upon what you did for us on the cross. And may we come to know you as our Savior through repentance and faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.